but this is probably the most important thing I could talk about, the Holy Eucharist. And, and let me begin by reading from the Gospel of John. I almost always begin with the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John whenever I talk about the Eucharist. And then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats my body and drinks my blood will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He whoever eats this bread will live forever. He whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Holy Eucharist, the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. The reason that priests, the reason that priests are ordained is primarily to confect the Eucharist. Everything else we do is really secondary to that. That's the greatest thing the priest does. He offers Mass. There's only one priest, absolutely speaking, Jesus, the high priest and perfect victim. And every priest called out from amongst the baptized is given a new sacrament, holy orders. And when that sacrament is imparted to the priest, he's taken up in Christ. Uh, a change transfigures his soul, as it were. Uh, the, the soul is reconfigured to Jesus, pri priest and victim. The change that takes place can even be called ontological, as the church teaches. That means it's a change that affects the very being itself. The, the man, the, the priest, is, is capacitated, empowered. And, and in a sense, we have to say with St. Paul, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. I live and move and have my being in him. Uh, we priests know we have no power on our own. We know we're sinners. We're nothing. Jesus is everything. The Lord is everything. Now what happens at the Holy Eucharist? Jesus, the high priest, working through the instrumentality of his ministerial priest at Holy Mass, at the center of the Mass, the focal point of the Mass, the pivotal point of the Mass, the consecration. Plain bread, plain wine, with the words of consecration is changed. Jesus, speaking through his ministerial priest, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood. The blood of the new and everlasting covenant, it will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this. In memory of me. What happens? Jesus' words, through the power of the Holy Spirit, changes the bread and wine in substance. The bread and wine is changed in its very essence into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is not merely a sign of Christ's presence. It is an efficacious sign. That means it affects what it signifies. It's a sacrament, in other words. And so what happens? The bread and wine changes in substance, in substance. Still looks like bread, 
still tastes like wine, but the substance is changed. It's Jesus himself. Now that's our faith. That's our faith. Don't mess with it. I don't care who you are. It is the Lord, and falling down, we adore him. We believe that. That is not fiction. That is not medieval theology. That is the, the doctrine of the faith. It's the Lord. Now, that is pivotal. You can't be Catholic and not believe that. It's Jesus himself. That being said, Imagine with what great reverence and with what great purity we ought to approach such a magnificent gift from God. The soul should be as clean as it can be. And that means basically no mortal sin. Okay? Don't be scrupulous but be sensible, spiritually speaking. If you are conscious of mortal sin, you've got to go to confession before you receive the Holy Eucharist. Now, you and I know that is a no-brainer. That's not rocket science, spiritually speaking. That's elemental, fundamental, basic Catholic teaching. You don't approach the Holy Eucharist if you are conscious of grave sin. What's mortal sin? Uh, very, the quick course, okay? Uh, differentiate mortal sin. The word mortal, it means deadly. Mortal sin extinguishes the life of grace in the soul, separates us from God. Mortal sin, in other words, it kills you, spiritually speaking, as opposed to venial sin, okay? Mortal sin, three constituent parts. Number one, grave matter, serious matter. The thing in itself, the sin in itself, is serious. Number two, you have to have knowledge that it's serious. Number three, you give full consent of the will in the light of that knowledge. Those, those three constituent parts have to be in place simultaneously in order to have a mortal sin subjectively imputed, assuming there are no significant mitigating circumstances, uh, meaning a mental illness, or the habituated nature uh, of a sin, and so forth. All right? Now, basic principle. I don't know who's in mortal sin, absolutely speaking. Only God knows that, okay? Uh, if someone is committing adultery, uh, I can say that's grave matter, that's serious matter, the thing in itself, okay? The first constituent part of a mortal sin. If someone has a, a, an abortion, knowingly and willingly, okay? The first thing, the, the sin in itself, that's serious, okay? Number two, do they have knowledge? Not everybody has knowledge of everything. Uh, it's amazing how people don't know certain things are sin. Now, some things you know because it's just written in your heart. You know, if you haven't extinguished the voice of conscience altogether. And then full consent of the will. God knows the state of the soul. I don't. I can't look at you or somebody else and say, oh, they're in mortal sin. I don't know. So I, you know, you've heard, well, don't judge your neighbor. Right. But, that being said, let me say this. You must make rational judgments and moral judgments. The problem is do not be quick and don't do it at all to, to impute guilt to a subject of action, okay? But, if someone, especially someone that I have authority over, if I'm a dad or a mom, right? and my son uh, is living with his girl, girlfriend, or he wants to, and he's 15 years old or something. Ain't gonna happen, you know? I, I, I can and must 
look at that and say that situation in itself is serious. That's serious matter, right? That's grave matter. The first constituent part that determines a mortal sin from a venial sin. Number two, knowledge. Well, if Junior doesn't have knowledge, when I get done with him, he will. <laughs> and so he ain't getting off because he doesn't have knowledge. And if someone else, an adult, or a politician, or a theologian, or a bishop, doesn't have knowledge, I don't see how there can be an excuse for that, but if he doesn't, then he will after I get done talking. And if he wants to reject it, that's his business. He can reject it. You can't force anybody. All you can do is lay it out, and they can take it or leave it. Now, every so often in the affairs of men, whether in the secular order or the church, we reach critical junctures. We reach turning points, decisive times in history. And these times will often determine the greatness or the failure of men. They are opportunities to rise to an occasion. Great and monumental turning points bring out the best and the worst of men. Wars, catastrophes. They bring out the best of the worst. You can rise to the occasion, or you can bury your head in the sand, and history will pass you by, forget you, disgrace you, or curse you. And we have reached such a time. We have reached such a time in our country. We have reached such a time in our church. And we have reached such a time in the world. We have a crisis of manhood today. We have a crisis of leadership today. We have a crisis of heroes today. And the world cries out for a remedy, as does the church, as does our country. And so you reach those junctures, and you've got to make a decision. I've reached one of those junctures. And although I have a free will and I have to make a decision and I agonize over things, in the end, I've never really had a problem with it because I'm not able to go a certain way because, oh, a couple of things. Number one, I think the Holy Spirit has enough of a grip on my head to make me do what he wants to do. But number two, I'm scared. I'm fearful. Um, I've said this many times, and I'll say it one more. I have a soul to save, too. I have a soul to save, too, just like you. And the salvation of our soul is tied up in our state in life. You know, husbands and wives, your salvation is tied up in that mutual exchange of love and raising the children and so forth. Priests, well, that's our state in life, and our salvation is tied up in the faithful exercise of that ministry. And as the query of ours, St. John Vianney, the patron saint of parish priests, often used to say, I rejoice to be your brother, fellow Christian, but I'm scared to be your pastor. I'm afraid to be a doctor of souls, as it were. It's an awesome responsibility. It's a great thing to have authority, whether it's political or ecclesial. And the only authentic authority, really, whether in the political order or the ecclesial, the church, is the authority of service. 
The only authentic authority is the authority of service. For Jesus said, I've come to serve, not to be served. And in the end, that service took the form of crucifixion. And very often, what it comes right down to is leaders have to do hard things and dirty things, things that they will be rejected for, things that they will be cursed for, things that the world doesn't understand. But if they do the right thing, in the end, they'll be lifted up and God will bless them and give them the reward. For many reasons, our country, and I love our country, and I know you do too, our country has reached a critical juncture. We're at a crossroads. I truly believe that. I do not mean to be a prophet of doom. I don't, I don't want to be a pessimist, only a realist. But I look around and I see what's transpired in just my lifetime. I see where we came from, and I see where we are now. And I see us poised on the precipice that separates us from disaster. We live in a moral wasteland. It used to be a wholesome, good environment. And now, take a look around. Abortion, for these many years, the law of the land. First time I saw a certain passage in the Old Testament, it says, can judges who do evil be pleasing to God? And I couldn't help but think of the current situation. No law, in quotation marks, that contradicts, overturns, and subverts the natural law and the divine law can be authentic law. What that kind of law does is destroy law, subvert law, pervert law. And the so-called law that a woman has a right to an abortion, that isn't authentic law. That's the subversion of law. It's not licit law. And yet it has gone on year after year after year. Abortion is intrinsically evil. The thing in itself is never justified. It is grave, grave matter. Taking the life of the innocent. Some would say, yeah, but what about the death penalty? People short on brains and understanding make that argument. I'm sorry. It is, how can you equate the two? Abortion takes the life of an innocent person. Now, the death penalty, I agree, today uh, scarcely has a, a necessary application, as the Holy Father has pointed out, that we have other means at our disposal to protect society. And so we probably don't need the death penalty, but the death penalty is not intrinsically evil. That's the teaching of the church, and that's the difference. Abortion is intrinsically evil. Always, everywhere, it's indefensible. The death penalty, on the other hand, is not intrinsically evil. It may well be, and I think it is, that we don't need it in this country today. Okay, don't try to equate the two, or, or to try to equate the two with legitimate self-defense. And I'm not going to go into the thing about the war in Iraq being just unjust, that's not the point. The point is certain things are intrinsically evil, certain things are not. Abortion, homosexual sex, human cloning, 
Things of that order are intrinsically evil. They are never justifiable under any circumstance. And yet, we take what is tantamount to murder and ennoble it with the term law, indeed a noble term. It is not authentic law. And the longer this country goes on, laboring under that fallacious presupposition that it's law, the more endangered we become. I tell you this and I tell it to you with 100% absolute subjective certainty. All the Osama bin Ladens and Saddam Husseins and Adolf Hitlers and Joseph Stalins rolled together aren't near the threat to national security that immorality is. And abortion at the head of the list. I have a hard time sleeping at night because of it. Every day that goes by, the clock ticking, millions and millions and millions of lives, the most innocent lives, snuffed out. What should be the safest place in the universe for them? Their own mother's wombs taken out before they have a chance to begin. And their blood cries out from the earth for vengeance. It is a sin that is so heinous, so horrible, so dangerous for society. Euthanasia, playing God, Abortion, playing God, deciding when life ends, when it begins. Same-sex marriage. It's another nail in the coffin of our country. And listen to what I say, because you won't have to wait long for the consequences of it to be seen if it happens. I am my brother's keeper. Remember what, what God, or what, that, what Cain said to God, am I my brother's keeper? Of course he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, you bet I am. Which comes to a very important point that I haven't heard brought out in a very long time. Traditionally, the Catholic Church has always instructed its faithful that you can sin by participating in the sin of another. There's more than one way to sin. Oh, yes, I can sin by a, an overt commission of a sin. But I can also be extremely culpable through the sins of another person. Traditionally, the Church has listed nine ways that you can participate in the sin of another. Number one, by counsel. You counsel them that they should do this or that. One time I know of a woman, I know this case, I know this firsthand. The poor woman was 40 and she conceived and she already had several children. It was an accident. And she <laughs> went to her, her priest. You know, she was upset. Gosh, I can't have another child now. She goes to the doctor, confirms it, and so forth. The doctor says, well, yeah, it's more dangerous when you're older, but women do it, you'll be okay. I'll, you know, we can, we have, we, we'll take care of you. Kind of uh, calmed her down, consoled her. And then she went to her parish priest. And he said, oh, Betty, you can always have an abortion. By counsel, by command. You know, those in authority can command someone to do something that's immoral. 
Nazi Germany, gas the Jews, bake the Catholics, exterminate them. The war came and went, the war trials at Nuremberg. And the lesser officers pleaded we were only following orders. And they hung them at Nuremberg. Hmm, you can sin to command by participating in the sin of another. Oh, but he pulled the trigger. You ordered him to. You enabled him to. You facilitated what he did. By consent. I'm personally opposed to it, but after all, we have to go along with it. I'm personally opposed to it, but politically, I'm in favor of it. We have a lot of schizophrenics in political office. <laughs> It is the lamest argument since Aaron tried to explain to Moses what happened with the golden calf. <laughs> Moses went up on the mountain, prayed, came back. They were all making merry, and they were worshiping a golden calf. You remember what Aaron said to Moses? Moses was furious. Aaron said, well, Moses, I don't know, I don't know what happened. We just put some gold in the furnace, and this calf came out. By provocation, you can provoke someone into sin. You share in their sin. By praise or flattery. I know of Catholic institutions that have welcomed politicians who voted for abortion and partial birth abortion. They've welcomed them with open arms, flattered them, encouraged them. And I'll add that these were Catholic politicians, if I didn't say that in the first place. By concealment, you can participate in the sin of another by concealment, by concealing, covering up their sin. I wonder what that brings to mind in recent months and years. It is absolutely possible to commit grievous sin, terrible sin, by being an accomplice. Just like you can be an accomplice to murder in criminal law, an accomplice to fraud, an accomplice to all kinds of crimes. You can be an accomplice to sin, and that's sin in itself. Another way, by, by partaking in the sin. So Senator Catholic votes repeatedly for measures that encourage, authorize, legitimize, and promote abortion. Oh, they use verbal engineering to soften the bite. They call it pro-choice. Now, that's a wonderful sounding term. Who could be offended at choice? That's a great thing. Choice is a wonderful thing. This is a free country. Wonderful. Think. Do you have a brain or not? Right to choose what? A right to choose what? The choice was made, and you conceived. And now the only choice is to nurture life, not to snuff it out. But the language, the serpentine semantics, sound so good. You know what a sophist is? In Greek philosophy, there was a certain class of philosophers called sophists. Boy, they could talk, but they didn't say anything. <laughs> they were real slippery-tongued devils. Oh, they'd talk on and on and on, and the eloquence 
And people would say, ooh, ah, doesn't Sophocles speak wondrously? And someone with half a brain would say, oh yeah, what'd he say? <laughs> and the fact of the matter is he didn't say anything, but it sure sounded good. They made a very nice, lucrative living by talking slick. What does that remind you of? <laughs> How else can you participate in the sin of another? By silence. Number eight, by silence. And we have had a deafening silence too many years and we go from bad to worse and millions and tens of millions of babes snuffed out in their own mother's womb and we're silent and God gives the grace of authority to Catholics and then they are silent in the face of gross moral evil the further up the chain of command you go, the more responsibility you have. And when you breach that responsibility, the greater the crime that is imputed to you. So when a, when a private is derelict in his duties, that's one thing. When a general is a derelict in his duties, that's quite another thing. If the private doesn't carry out his mission, he may die. His buddy may die. When the general is derelict in his duties, the whole country may die. And so the higher up the chain of command you go, to the man who's been given more, more will be required. And so time marches on and the blood cries out from the earth and the immorality goes from bad to worse and the catastrophes come and the natural disasters come and 9-11 comes and what's next? Wake up America, wake up and repent for if we do not repent sackcloth and ashes and do it fast, then what's coming will be a catastrophe that you can't even imagine. One nuclear bomb in the heart of Los Angeles will be a catastrophe unprecedented. And so what must we do? Every one of us has an obligation in conscience. We live in a free country, a democratic country. I cannot, nor would I, attempt to tell you ever who to vote for. That's none of my business. No one can tell you that. That is your business and your business alone. But can I and must I give you principles to help you form your conscience and then vote your conscience. Yes, I, not only can I do that, I must, and I can lose my immortal soul if I fail in that mission. A Catholic is elected to office. And I assure you that part of the reason he was elected to office is because he was Catholic. Catholics voted for him. Does he believe what the Catholic Church believes? Now a person who makes the specious appeal to personally believing one thing but politically acting in another way, that's a real strange form of political and moral schizophrenia. If that, that's a dual personality if I ever saw one. In other words, it's a phony argument. Don't ever buy it. It doesn't hold water. 
And, and perhaps they'll say, well, yes, but I've come to a different position from the Catholic Church. Now, I'm talking about a Catholic here who purports to be a Catholic in good standing and who approaches the sacraments after having voted repeatedly in favor of abortion, partial birth abortion, same-sex marriage, human cloning perhaps, who knows what else down the road. By the way, once you cross the line for abortion, anything goes. Because if you can snuff an infant in his mother's womb, you can do anything. You can do anything. And so what shall we think? Mr. Catholic politician, he claims to be a good Catholic, and yet, well, I've come to a, a different position than the church. I've thought about it, and I, my conscience says that I can do this. I feel the woman has a right. You crossed over the line. You don't accept the teaching of the church. That is an essential teaching of the church, the teaching on life. The teaching that abortion is intrinsically evil, never permissible under any circumstances. You reject that. Let me give you the formal definition of heresy. An obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith or morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning same. And the penalty for it is automatic excommunication. And it doesn't require the act of a bishop. It's a latte sententiae excommunication. Ipso facto, the act in itself triggers it. Now think about the reality. Powerful senators and congressmen, even perhaps presidents, and they promote, they facilitate, they collaborate in, their accomplices to the heinous crime of abortion. Their vote contributed materially to the demise of countless children in this horrible atrocity. It's a holocaust beyond imagination. And we said, never again. And here we have another class of persons brutally discriminated against. What is the status of those politicians? Oh, they say, well, you don't know the state of their soul. That's true, absolutely speaking. God knows, right? God knows. But what do I know? Well, I know they're Catholic. I know they're approaching the sacraments. I know that they have a chronic problem with promoting things that are grossly and intrinsically evil. The scandal which they give is public. Hence, the redress must be public. You cannot have public scandal without having public redress. You cannot make a specious appeal. You cannot make a specious appeal to conscience or to privacy. If the sin were private, confess it in private. I don't have a problem with you. Not at all. But when year after year, vote after vote, scandal is radiated over all the country, and not a word said about it, and they come up and receive Holy Communion, Remember, it's not merely a sign, it's Jesus. And to receive him in anything less than a state of grace is a horrible sacrilege. And shall we now be collaborators in sacrilege? That's the next frightening thought. And so what, what do we do? Well, we can pray. What do the bishops do? I would never presume to tell a bishop what to do because he has the hardest job in the world, and I sympathize with that. And I respect every bishop in the world. And I love every bishop in the world, and I pray for every bishop in the world. And I know they're up against it. 
I have great sympathy for them. That being said, with every great office comes a commensurate responsibility. The politician who claims to be Catholic and publicly supports such moral outrages cannot publicly be admitted to the sacraments. Would I, would I deny him at the communion rail? I'm not even getting into that. That's not my business. I, I, I may not. I don't know. If he came up, I would hope I wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be a conflict at the altar rail, as some have said. It does not have to be a confrontation at the altar rail. It ought to be dealt with long before he gets to the altar rail. That's the problem. And so we, we struggle, we suffer, we labor, but I truly believe that we've come to a critical juncture. You look back to the last presidential election, how close it was. 50-50 almost. You couldn't get any closer than that. I mean, the, the number of votes that were involved that close, frightening. And then the Supreme Court came down with the decision on December 12th the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. And that'll give you a clue about what to do next. Pray. Pray the rosary. But I remind all those in authority, and they may say, you've got no business, little man, reminding any of us of anything. And I say, well, with all due respect, you may be right. The little man maybe shouldn't be reminding the big man of things like that. Other big men ought to remind the big men of their <laughs> omissions. And some of them have, and some of them have, and they're heroes. And you ought to thank God for them. The hour is late. Bishops make a stand, show some backbone, pastoral care, sometimes love has to be strong. Oh, it's patient and kind to be sure, but it also has to be strong. The moment has come for greatness. The time for mediocrity is long past. The time for sitting on a fence, overdue. God's about to reach down and shake the fence. Which side will we be on? Will we be found to have been defenders of truth, defenders of life, or through indifference or cowardice, something less than that? The world cries out for a hero, the political order, and the ecclesial as well. And the faithful, for your part, you need to pray like you've never prayed before, for the approach of the deadline is coming, the approach of midnight, the approach of deep, dark darkness, the approach of an evil beyond your wildest imagination, if we don't act, if we don't act. For I tell you, how many, how many more abortions can God countenance? How much more immorality can he endure? Goes from bad to worse. I have often read a passage that frightened me, and yet it encourages me. And I'll read it to you in closing. It's a passage from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 3. No, yes, chapter 3, verse 16 and following. And at the end of the seven days, Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, 
I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hands. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his sins. But you will have saved your life. Again, if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you have not warned him. He shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall live because of the warning, and you, you will have saved your soul. The greater the authority, the greater the responsibility. To be Catholic is a great gift. To be Christian, a great gift. The great gift carries with it a commensurate responsibility. To be a Catholic politician or servant of the people is a great gift. The great gift carries with it a commensurate responsibility. To be a priest or a bishop in the Catholic Church is a great gift. Carries with it an awesome responsibility responsibility to at least exercise the spiritual works of mercy, one of which is to admonish the sinner, one of which is to instruct the ignorant, one of which is to counsel the doubtful. We have a lot of doubt, we have a lot of ignorance, and we have a lot of sin. And so we have a lot of spiritual mercy to be handing out. It is a merciful thing to call the sinner to repentance. It is a merciful thing to point to those who have caused grave public scandal and to cause them or require them to repent publicly. I believe, and there are many theologians who would disagree, I believe that these persons, because of the gravity of their act, because it is tantamount to heresy, have brought down a canonical penalty on themselves. I believe they've separated themselves from the body of Christ. Their words say one thing and their actions say quite another. And actions do speak louder than words. And so is it pastoral care to let them skip and dance on their merry way to hell, or rather should we get a backbone and get a brain and get some real pastoral care and some real mercy and charity and help them. Yes, we come to those crossroads in life where we have to make a decision be comfortable, coast along, don't rock the boat, don't make any waves, and consign yourself to mediocrity at best and hell at worst. Or do we make a decision to shake off the yoke of mediocrity and to make a decision that comes from faith, strong faith in the principles which the martyrs died for, principles which are now being trampled underfoot by those who call themselves Catholic and being allowed to get away with it. For your part, inform your conscience. Inform your conscience 
and then live in accordance with that conscience, and to be sure, vote in accordance with that conscience. God bless you. God love you. Goodbye.